for Congress in 2012. She has an MBA. She is a certified meeting professional and certified sommelier. Is that how you pronounce it? Anyway, she's a, a wine expert. <laughs> Come on, and, isn't this Sonoma County? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> she comes from a farming and ranching background. Her parents own property up in Siskiyou County. So this has caused her to be an expert on how our rural property rights are under attack. So she's going to be speaking on UN Agenda 21, the biggest threat to our constitution, representative government that is now under attack, and our personal rights under attack. She'll talk about the Plan Bay area, which many of us are familiar with because we were fighting it here. This is where nine counties are put under this big regional government. And she is going to be talking about how they're trying to bring down the dams in Siskiyou County and bring in over 400 wolves to drive the farmers and ranchers out even more. And she'll also talk about the NDAA, which is the National Defense Authorization Act. All of that in one hour's time. <laughs> so, so if you don't mind, just quietly eating and give your attention to Debbie Bachikaluka. I saw this fortune cookie over there and I thought I'd open it up and see what it says because these days I think we need a lot of luck on our side. You will be rewarded for being a good listener. Maybe they're talking about you. You have that plan. <laughs> Give me another one. Good afternoon. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm always nervous when I give this presentation. Actually, I've never given the same presentation over, so this is a new presentation for me. But um, the more we know, in my mind, in my opinion, the scarier it gets. Yeah. And uh, how many would agree with me on that? And just out of curiosity, how many have seen a, a presentation that I've given before? Okay, great. So hopefully for you, uh, you'll see some new material. In fact, I know you will see some new material. My presentation is called High Speed Agenda 2-1, like Agenda 21. This is an agenda to one, one world governance, a new world order. And at one point, we found the West, and I think we've lost the West. And I believe it's in the details that we can find the West again. Now, um, oh, and also this is just a couple of techn technological issues. Uh, I see one right now. Normally I'm on a bigger screen, so this is uh, because of the height of the, the room. Uh, you may see some discombobulated slides, but anyway, this slide is supposed to say the most important areas of our lives are children, education, our homes, and our health are now under control by the federal government. How many knew that? Obama said, if Congress won't act soon to protect future generations, I will. And he certainly has. And if that wasn't enough, if it wasn't enough to have the federal government in control of the most important areas of our lives, I'd like to show you this video. And I'd like to get a, a show of hands. How many people have seen the C-SPAN video of Nancy Pelosi, um, Broom, uh, Bloomfield, and um, Engel, both Republicans and Democrats, uh, talking about Agenda 21. Okay, great. So for many of you, this is new. And as they call us conspiracy theorists and tinfoil hat wearers, as we go around talking about Agenda 21 and all these attacks on our private property, I want you to remember this video and anyone can find this online. House Concurrent Resolution 353, Concurrent Resolution, expressing the sense of the Congress that the United States should assume a strong leadership role in implementing the decisions made at the Earth Summit by developing a national strategy to implement Agenda 21 and other Earth Summit agreements through domestic policy and foreign policy by cooperating with all countries to identify and initiate further agreements to protect the global environment and by supporting and participating in a high-level United Nations Sustainable Development Commission. 
Mr. Speaker, I rise in strong support of H. Congress 353, expressing the sense of the Congress that the United States should assume a strong leadership role in implementing the decisions made at the Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro, developing a national strategy to implement Agenda 21 and other Earth Summit agreements through domestic policy and foreign policy. I now yield to the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Pelosi, the sponsor, to explain the resolution. The gentlewoman from California is recognized. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Speaker. I thank the gentleman for yielding. In fact, it is a very simple resolution which the gentleman has just mostly explained. Uh, the Earth Summit Environmental Leadership Act, as this is known, presents us with an opportunity to follow up on the important work of the Earth Summit to develop its blueprint, Agenda 21 for envir global environmental action. H. Congress 353 outlines a comprehensive national strategy for st sustainable development in accordance with the principles of Agenda 21. The resolution also urges the United States to identify and initiate further agreements to protect the global environment and to support the creation of a high-level United Nations Sustainable Development Commission headed by an Undersecretary General. The 71 co-sponsors uh, of this measure include one half the members of the Foreign Affairs Committee and all of the uh, House delegates to the Earth Summit. It is also supported by the major United States non-governmental organizations uh, concerned with the environmental issues. I urge my colleagues to support this resolution. Mr. Speaker, the, uh, I do support this resolution, which expresses a sense of Congress with uh, respect to implementing the decisions of the recent United Nations Conference on Environment and Development. And I do want to express and commend the gentlelady from California, Mrs. Pelosi, for her sponsorship of this important resolution. The fact is that the United States government made a very constructive contribution in Rio and in the talks that led to the meeting in Rio. Largely as a result of the conference, they adopted four major items. The Rio Declaration on Environment and Development, the lengthy action plan referred to as Agenda 21, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, and the non-binding but authoritative principles for the management and cons conservation of forest resources. In addition, the conference adopted the UN Biodiversity Convention. The administration has already made a good beginning in implementing the results of the conference. And this, during the talks on climate, the administration pledged $75 million for related projects in developing countries, including the development of national plans. So not a lot of people have seen that. In fact, it's gotten very little views on the internet. And the amazing thing is Republicans and Mr. Democrats, Speaker, I urge my the, colleagues uh, to support, support this, this resolution. resolution. Both support this resolution. Now, Broomfield, as you can see, he's a Republican from Michigan. He mentioned a couple of important things. He mentioned the Convention on Biodiversity. He also mentioned that the implementation, they were already well on on their way to implementing the agenda. What they're talking about is Agenda 21. So next time someone calls you a conspiracy theorist for talking about Agenda 21, you refer them to this video and you say it is fact. We are not the conspirers, they are. Now, I had, you know, we all want the truth, right? I'm with you on trying to find the truth and tell my patriot friends what's going on. So I had to go, as I was being called a conspiracy theorist, I had to go to the Rio Earth Summit in 2012 when I was running for Congress to find out for myself if United Nations Agenda 21 Sustainable Development was actually real. Here is my United Nations badge. So now I'm a United Nations global citizen. I also have my little ICLEI badge so that people at the conference would think that I was all for this sustainable movement agenda so I could get videos at the conference without being kicked out. And what they called the United Nations Conference on Sustainable Development was the future we want. Remember Obama talked about future generations? You'll see that there's a theme here. Well, anyway, the future we want. Well, I'm a corporate event planner, and for a conference that was supposed to be about sustainable development, saving the earth, I can tell you that is not what the conference was about. 
It was about printing off thousands and thousands and thousands of outcome documents minute by minute as they changed for a future we want. It was about uh, massive uh, buildings being brought in, helicopters being brought in, private airplanes being flown in to bring people from around the world, about 50,000 is what they estimate to this conference, on sustainable development. And there was subflooring, and there was lighting, and there were plants, and there was decor, and there was entertainment, and there was music, and there were waste everywhere, and not a whole lot of recycling. So I can tell you, as someone who went to the conference, it was not about saving the earth. It was about something else. And I wasn't the only woman Brazil who went. Brazil has done the world a great service went by too. hosting us all here. This can be a fractious time, but thanks to Brazil's deft and effective leadership, we have coalesced around an outcome document that marks a real advance for sustainable development. We know this is one of the most pressing matters of our time because how we grow together over the long term isn't a question for only some countries. It is a question for all countries. But let's be honest. Right? We know what is possible. We know what we could do. But we also know that future is not Guaranteed. The future is not because guaranteed. Because the resources that we all depend upon, fresh water, thriving of... She said some pretty important things, too. Our common future, thriving water. She was just going to tell you that the land is, is unerable at this time. And we need to change, is what she's going to tell you. There's some important years starting in 1992 with that video that you just saw um, for implementing United Nations Agenda 21 Sustainable Development. In 1992, not only was there the Rio Earth, Earth Conference, um, but George Herbert Walker Bush, Republican, soft laws, signs a treaty, or soft laws, Agenda 21 into the United States of America, followed by President Clinton, in 1993, by creating the by creating through executive order the President's Council for Sustainable Development, or you see it as President's Council on Sustainable Development. In 1997, we have counties and mayors creating the Joint Joint Center for Sustainable Communities, and then in 2001, we have the implementation of Smart Growth or Sustainable Communities. Now there are three main documents that make up United Nations Agenda 21. Most are familiar with this one. Remember when Broomfield said that lengthy document called Agenda 21, the lengthy, lengthy blueprint, that is this book. And in this book, there on chapter 28, is local authorities' initiatives in support of Agenda 21. Now how has Agenda 21 been implemented very quickly in the United States of America? Anybody heard of ICLEI? the International Council on Local Environmental Initiatives, also known as Local Authorities or Local Agenda 21. They wrote the 28th chapter of this book, and they claim, ICLEI in the United States claims, they have nothing to do with the United Nations. They are not implementing Agenda 21, and we know that that is not true. Oops, pardon me. The other document is the Global Biodiversity Assessment Report. And that is this book. This book I call my crook book. Because everything in here is about taking away our freedoms. And I'll give you a few ideas. On page 337 in this book, it says ski runs are unsustainable. Page 350, grazing of livestock, cows, sheep, goats, horses, unsustainable. Fencing of pastures, large hoofed animals, compact the soil, they are unsustainable. Aquaculture, modern hunting, harvesting of tim timber, logging activities, dams, reservoirs, straightening of rivers, power line construction, private property, page 767 and 782, private property is unsustainable. 783, land use that serves human needs, unsustainable. 
golf courses, scuba diving, unsustainable. So how many, raise your hands please, are living an unsustainable lifestyle according to United Nations Agenda 21? Here's some more, page 772. An agriculture world in which most human beings are peasants should be able to support about five to seven billion people. In contrast, a reasonable estimate for an industrialized world society at the present North American material standard of living would be one billion people. So in other words, how many people do they say that the earth can handle based on our lifestyles? One billion people, and how many people do we have in the world? And according to them, the numbers are only growing, and we're going to hit like 9 billion people by 2050, a very important date, by the way. Here's another one. National biodiversity strategies, action plans, or programs, as called for under Article 6 of the Convention on Biodiversity, remember Broomfield mentioned the Convention on Biodiversity, they're all behind it, and in Agenda 21 are, int are intended to identify appropriate conservation and sustainable use measures and specify how they will be implemented. Who's familiar with SB1? What is SB1? Who wants to yell it out? Gives money, a blank check to local organizations, local districts. It allows our California state government to declare suburbia and rural areas as blighted under what they say is insufficient use of land. That is page 927 of this book. The other document that's very important to the United Nations Agenda 21 Sustainable Development Movement is the United Nations Earth Charter. Who's heard of the Earth Charter? Great. The Earth Charter is about human rights. The Earth Charter is to replace the Ten Commandments. It's to deconstruct the Bill of Rights, the U.S. Constitution, the Declaration of Independence. It chips away at our freedoms, in other words, as individual human beings under na with natural rights. I went to Notre Dame Day Namor in Belmont, California. This is in the Bay Area. And they asked me to speak one day on what it was like to run for Congress against U.S. House of Representatives Jackie Speer. And I was so excited, and afterwards I thought I did a fantastic job really encouraging these young students to go out there and do anything they want. Because I have to tell you, I was scared to death to run for Congress, and I hit a lot of uh, dead ends running for Congress and uh, got death threats, and it was a great experience, and at the same time, it was very, it was like someone cut you open and just revealed all your insides. So anyway, after I thought I did a good job and I talked about how important the U.S. Constitution is to these students and protecting our private property rights, I walked out of the classroom and on this cork board was this. The Dorothy Stang Center Speaker Series at NDNU presents Dr. Mary Evelyn Tucker. Well, what was Dr. Mary Evelyn Tucker doing there besides coming from Yale? She was urging communities and student bodies to endorse the United Nations Earth Charter. In fact, it says it right in this pamphlet. So why is the Earth Charter so dangerous besides, you know, destroying our U.S. Constitution and our Declaration of Independence and our Bill of Rights? Well, here's what it teaches people, and it teaches students, and it teaches, you know, innocent people who don't understand what's going on. We are one human family and one Earth community with a common destiny. We must join together to bring forth a sustainable global society founded on respect for nature. Towards this end, it is imperative that we, the peoples of Earth, declare our responsibility to one another, to the greater community of life, and to future generations. In a nutshell, the term sustainable development is part of three very dangerous documents, based on lots of other reports, however. It's also based on our common future. Gro Brundtland of the United Nations wrote this book, and it's all about sharing a destiny. Remember the future we want. The term was first offered 
to the United Nations and it was adopted by the United Nations and in 1992 at the Rio Earth Summit, sustainable development became a priority even for the United States of America. And under sustainable development there are three E's, social equity, environmental justice, and economic justice. So everywhere you go now, companies, businesses, schools, individuals are now living by this doctrine of the three E's of sustainable development, social equity, environmental justice, and economic justice. Individuals, according to ICLEI, individual rights will have to take a back seat to the collective, in other words. So, so what is... That, that's Saint Simone, the contemporary of Marx, right? Yes, exactly. So, what does this mean for the future of the United States? Yeah. One world or communism. It means no private property because private property under the three E's, social equity, economic injustice, and environmental injustice is unsustainable. Now let me read, um, I have all my books here, I actually, this is just a few of my books, I've got quite a library on this Agenda 21, but let me just read from, from a few books, um, Agenda 21, this is by, uh, this is called the Earth Summit Strategy to Save Our Planet. Remember I uh, uh, told you that in 1993, Clinton, through executive order, created the President's Council on Sustainable Development. Well, he hired, or he had, um, one of his appointees was Daniel C. Tars. So he wrote this book, um, and the introduction is by U.S. Senator Paul Simon. And what it says on page 6 about Agenda 21 is that, here it is, effective execution of Agenda 21 will require a profound reorientation of all human society unlike anything the world has ever experienced. A major shift in the priorities of both governments and individuals and an unprecedented redeployment of human and financial resources. This shift will demand that a concern for the environmental consequences of every human action. Your breathing, that is a human action. Be integrated into individual and collective decision making at every level. The introduction by, was by U.S. Senator Paul Simon. This book is called Rescue Mission Planet Earth, a children's edition of Agenda 21. It's a United Nations workbook for children of all ages. Um, Al Gore helped write this book. Mikhail Gorbachev, Boutros Boutros Ghali. Um, it talks about the road to Rio, Agenda 21. But what Paul, Senator Paul Simon had to say about um, human beings is that every time, okay, here we go. This is called Baby Bomb. The planet groans every time it registers another birth. Imagine being a child and reading this workbook, The Planet Groaned When You Were Born. This is not the only Agenda 21 workbook. In fact, when you saw that picture of me at the United Nations bookstore, the entire children's section was sold out in minutes. When it comes to private property, the United Nations recommends that governments maintain full jurisdiction over land. What do we believe in here in the United States? What is private property? The thoughts in your head and what you do with your hands, what you create with your hands and the thoughts in your head is your private property until you give it away. Your body is your private property. Your religion is your private property. They also believe that land should be subject to public control and regulation. Remember, this is all about our common future, the common good. Zoning and land use planning should be under control of the land and mixed. we should be using mixed development enterprises straight from the United Nations documents. In 1976, the UN Conference on Human Settlements said land, 
and I've just paraphrased this, cannot be controlled by individuals. Private land ownership is also a principal instrument of accumulation and concentration of wealth, and therefore contributes to social injustice. Mm. Remember what the Global Biodiversity Assessment Report said about North American lifestyles? That based on our lifestyles, the Earth can only handle one billion people. Social justice can only be achieved if land is used in the interest of the society as a whole. What just happened in the One Bay Area Plan? What's happening with riparian rights? They're being chipped away. So again, we've got two very dangerous books, and then the United Nations Earth Charter, and then we have population control. So you're already getting an idea that we have population control. Well, someone who's commonly quoted by our federal and local and state governments is a Stanford professor named Paul Ehrlich. He wrote the book Population Bomb. And the foreword is by David Brower. And who David Brower is, uh, was the Sierra Club. He was also Earth First. His name comes up quite a bit. In the book, it talks about how population is destroying the Earth. And the more that the population grows, the more the earth requires uh, uh, natural resources, and the more natural resources we require, global climate change is occurring and the earth is dying. Here's what he says about who's involved in this fight. There's only two groups, according to Dr. Paul Ehrlich. Our population consists of two groups, a comparatively small one, dedicated to the preservation of beauty and wildlife, and a vastly larger one dedicated to the destruction of both. Who are you, who, who's in this room? We're the largely vast, we're the larger vast destructive group. And these radical environmentalists who are pushing through Agenda 21 and these politicians who are pushing through Agenda 21, they're they're the other side, the good side. And this, for you and me, regardless of how you look at it, is massive change. What kind of change? Behavior, behavior change. So non-government organizations, the Sierra Club, the Nature Conservancy, Environmental Defense Fund, many of them housed in San Francisco, and government want us to change our behavior, yet are they changing theirs? No, none of them are. They're consuming more, they're getting more homes, they're flying and, you know, lavishly overseas and spending our money on a lifestyle that's full of lavishes and riches for them while you and I fight and suffer. One of Obama's very first appointments was Cass Sunstein as the regulatory czar. He wrote a book called Nudge while he was a professor. I think he was at Harvard is where he was a professor. And in this book, he calls for how you can nudge people into doing what you want to do, how you can get them to change your, their behavior so that you can stop smoking, so that you can stop hunting. He thinks we are stupid, and he even says that. He calls us Homer Simpson-like. There's a bit of duh to all of us, and what can you do with someone's duh? What can you do with someone who is dumbed down? You can take advantage of them. You can get them to do what you want them to do. Here's a few examples from how that is occurring already. This is an actual slide from California Air Resource Board, and uh, it's actually from the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, and it is a presentation to the California Air Resource Board, who's in charge of our cap-and-trade program in California, and the uh, California Public Utility Commission. Behavior change, behavior change. They're talking about how do you get the public, the consumers, to change their behavior. Well, I've highlighted a few things. You can change from consumer ownership to rental service model. We have car shares, we have bike shares, we have vacation shares, we have cow shares, all these shares going on. Here's another slide. slide. We need to right size our homes, our appliance capacities. We need to use manual egg beaters. We need to, tonight, don't go home and watch TV or listen to the radio because that takes electricity. Play the guitar and bike versus drive on a beautiful sunny day like this. You should bike versus drive. But that's not all. 
They want you to change your lifestyle decision when it comes to a shared versus detached home. What does that mean? Multi-family homes. Stack and pack. Stack and pack housing. The one bay area plan. And we should also consider our car ownership and our car use. I drive something that looks sort of like that. They want to see me in that, but they really want to see me on that or on my feet. They want me not to use that. They want me to use this. And I'm okay because with that because I'm in a free country. And if I want to use the one on the left or the one on the right, at this point I have a choice. But if this agenda keeps going through, we will not have choices. Why? Because this is about our carbon footprint. We overconsume in North America. The earth can only handle one billion people based on our lifestyles. They want us to curb our consumerism. So you can find on the internet all sorts of websites. TerraPass, I've got one for children. I took the, the TerraPass one, I put my older car down, 1994 BMW 318i, a little cheap but cute car. And then I put how many, you know, air travel, I'm gonna travel 11,000 miles. I was gonna go to France to go to the next UN um, conference on global warming, but I decided, you know, my carbon footprint's too big, I better not do that. And then I put in my home energy in San Carlos, and I came up with 32,000 pounds of CO2 that I'm emitting just on those things alone. And that, to offset my carbon footprint, I can pay $190, it calculates it for you, and that $190 you could pay to TerraPass, and TerraPass then gives that money to some other third world country for some kind of clay oven or something like that or a wind turbine, or uh, seriously, something like that. Or they might pay the Nature Conservancy or the Sierra Club so that we are offsetting our carbon footprint. They're doing this to children. And you can take the children's test, which I did. And it's very hard to read. It was very hard to blow up. But after traveling to school, watching television, leaving TV on standby, using the computer, et cetera, et cetera, my total was 12,912 kgs of CO2, in other words, 12 tons a year. So here's what it says down here. Did you know? Did you know the average grown-up has a carbon footprint of 14 tons? Remember as a child, just on these things, I'm 12 tons. By 2050, we need to cut that down to two tons a year. In other words, this, as a child, needs to get down to probably one ton a year because they're smaller people, right? So that, is that not changing our behavior, our consumerism? Here's um, something I just found the other Sustainability day. Sustainability means that things can keep going, can sustain themselves, this is Boy and Scouts continue into America. the future Oops. and go on forever. From a human perspective, sustainability for our planet means that it can continue to do what it was designed to do. Provide fresh air, clean water, produce food, and allow us all to have a high quality of life forever. Unsustainability means that it cannot, and that is where we are now. Twenty years ago, scientists in Sweden developed a definition for sustainability with four basic principles. These can be seen as the care instructions for our planet. If we follow them, it is good for our planet. And because we're part of the system that is our planet, it's good for us too. The what was 20 years ago? The Rio Earth Summit. So anyway, now you can go further into Boy Scouts sustainable, um, sustainability uh, website, and you can now do a foot, footprint calculator. They have a, you can directly go to this footprint calculator, and I took that test, and um, it goes through and says, you know, how many globes the Earth uh, I require in order to live the lifestyle that I live. And after taking this test, it would re I would require 6.2 Earth's globes of natural resources in order to live the lifestyle that I do live. Further things in this website, so this is just me taking the test, and you can do it too. All you have to do is go find it on the uh, Boy Scouts of America. They're green to deep green movement. 
What is the green to deep green movement look like? Can you see the three circles? Those are the three E's of sus sustainable development. That each circle represents a circle of sustainable development. Social equity, environmental justice, and economic justice. So, out, so some other things that are on this website, you can go directly link to the EPA and Living a Green Lifestyle um, and how you can start consuming less. Um, you might uh, consider not shopping as much, you might not buy a DVD, it gives you suggestions on what you should and shouldn't do. You can also now get a sustainability merit badge as a Boy Scout. So I called Boy Scouts of America as soon as I saw this yesterday and they hung up on me. And I told them that you, or prior to them hanging up on me, you are quoting the United Nations and it flies in the face of what Boy Scouts of America is all about, which is us being able to go out into the rural lands, to go camping, to you know, have a campfire, all these things that we love to do. And here's what they quoted from Gro, Harlem, Brundtland. Remember, our common future Sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Now you will see that quote everywhere, including in the documents of the One Bay Area Plan where we just got regionalized. Anyway, it goes on and on and, and um, it's quite an interesting site. Uh, it is definitely United Nations Agenda 21, there is no doubt. Children are being taught all about sustainability. In fact, the movement is called Education for Sustainability, and you can find it in Common Core as well. They're being taught about systems and critical thinking, and I know that Orlean and everyone else is going to show you a lot more when we go to the next panel session. And what I put on your table was a, um, a new book called Training for Treason by Holly Swanson. How many have heard of Holly Swanson? Phenomenal speaker. Um, she's been fighting Agenda 21 and this movement for many, many, many years. She ties this movement with the Green Party, communism. Your children and grandchildren are being taught communism. Is this the future we want, I ask you? Is this the future we want? No. Absolutely not. And if it is a future you want, you're in the wrong place. <laughs> Now, here's something I want you to know about California and our California websites. You could say, you know what, Debbie, that's all fine and good, but how do you know that this is actually being implemented in the United States or even California alone? I can tell you that because our own Biodiversity Council, remember the Global Biodiversity Assessment Report, is quoting not only Reed Noss, who has, was a creator of the Wildlands Project, which we're going to talk about in just a little bit, but it also quotes the World Resources Institute, the World Conservation Union, and the United Nations Environment Program. And it also quotes this book, The Global Biodiversity Strategy, 1992. That's this book. This is a United Nations book. On the front, World Resources Institute, the World Conservation Union, United Nations Environment Program. Other UN uh, groups, organizations, the Food and Agriculture Organization, UNESCO, it quotes all of this. <coughs> right? We don't want that future. <laughs> so here's the other thing. So this is about what is biodiversity. They were quoting, they were pulling quotes. That's Jerry Brown. Here's another thing that's on their websites. This is a typical farm, right? And look at all the CO2 action, except for on this wind turbine. Yeah. That is the only thing, according to them, what they're teaching the public, does not create any CO2 or any disturbance in the air. And then there's a movement now for USDA, for meatless Mondays or beefless whatevers. They don't want your children eating meat. Why? Large hooked animals are not sustainable, according to them. But as they tell you that beef makes you obese, this is the fact. And I am a cattle rancher's daughter, so we raise beef. Zinc, three ounces of beef. In order to get the same amount of zinc protein, zinc, 
You, nutrition, you have to eat 12 cans of 3 ounce cans of tuna. Beef provides protein. Soy isn't a natural, good natural, uh, dense form of protein. But they want you to eat soy, and Orlean can tell you all about soy. B12, brain and nervous system. In order to get B12, three ounces of beef, your palm, or seven chickens. Now what is going to make you more obese? They also want you to stop using livestock products, right? Byproducts. But I can tell you that every product in this slide is a beef byproduct. So even the environmentalists, after they travel around the world and go to these big United Nations conferences, that's my timer saying, timer's, time is running out. As they go to these big conferences, they're using beef byproducts. Candles are beef byproducts. Asphalt, anything that sticks, often has a beef byproduct in it or a livestock byproduct. This is my awesome pig book. See how thick this pig book is? Over a thousand byproducts just from the pig alone. We cattle ranchers, we agriculture people, we say that over 99% of the cow or the pig is used. Now is that sustainable? Yes. I agree. Livestock byproducts are everywhere. They were used to help build this room, as a matter of fact. We've got a big math problem, bad one, here in California. My parents are cattle ranchers up in Siskiyou County. Hay and dust is now considered a pollutant. The Endangered Species Act, $25,000 if a dead fish is found on their property, if it's under the endangered species list. They want us to do fencing setbacks. Orlean said that right now that in this area they're starting to do encroach on more on riparian um, rights. So that means if you're on a waterway, they're going to have further fencing setbacks. Takes more of your private property away. Anyway, if you put all this stuff together, including cap and trade, which no one knows about yet, and Obamacare, which no one knows about the cost of that yet, this is a huge, huge attack on our farmers and ranchers and our communities in California, and that, to me, is unsustainable. They are on our federal government, our local governments, our uh, state governments, and radical environmental groups are on an agenda to remove dams across this country. You can see here at this NGO, 26,000 dams need to go. But then you see this report right here, June 12th, this is a recent one. They talk about the largest dam removal in history, which is in Northern California. All four of these dams owned by Warren Buffett. And the former Department Secretary of Interior, Bruce Babbitt, said early, about a year ago, with public opinion now moving our way, the Elwha in Washington was completed. They destroyed it. Others will have their own compelling priorities. And there are still 75,000 dams in the United States to consider for removal. That is billions and billions of acre feet of stored water. Here's what the Elwha looked like. It was clean, green, hydroelectric energy. The only thing it needed was a fish ladder. But they didn't want to put in a fish ladder. Because according to them, this is all about the fish being able to swim upstream as far as it wants. And remember, under Agenda 21 in the global biodiversity, dams are unsustainable, and straightening of rivers is unsustainable. That's what the Elwha looks like after they destroyed it. And prior to that, it was a beautiful lake. There were two beautiful lakes with thousands of birds. Klamath River is going to be the largest dam removal in history if it gets its way. This is in Siskiyou County, which is where my parents are. And then there's Drake's Oyster Farm. How many know about Drake's Oyster Farm? They had over 308,000 photos, the National Park Service and the Department of Interior. And not one photo showed that the Lenny family was guilty of, of disturbing the seals. And they said that the oyster farm has to be closed anyway. Debbie? Yeah. If I could interrupt for a yeah. minute. Uh, Sharon and... Okay. Uh, and, and let, she, go ahead. Let me, let, me, let me just say this. Let, let, I think that this is probably the most important... Can we hold off until she finishes? This is probably the most important thing I want you to, to take today. We, we need, we've got a serious problem with wolves. Our government right now is working on protecting wolves. 
I was just at the um, Sitaway family. Um, this is a video that I took of the wolf kill. Um, 176 sheep. They don't want you to know about this attack. They're trying to hide attacks like this. They want Siskiyou County. They say Siskiyou County can handle 470 wolves alone. These wolves are like this. They're disease-carrying, killing machines. They are apex. They are the top of the food chain killer. And when they take away your guns, we have no defense over these ruthless animals. They are not cute. The Sierra Club is sending out cute little stamp pictures. I have a video of a girl that our California Department of Fish and Game is tracking a wolf right now. People are sending President Barack Obama and the new D Department of Interior Secretary um, Sally Jewell information saying, please protect these wolves. Children, This I found this in my school. Aww. Sign here and send it. And here's what I want you to know. Public comment, we need you in Sacramento on October 2nd. In Sacramento at the Clarion Hotel. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is hosting only three public comment meetings. One in California, one in Sacramento, one in Albuquerque, and one in Washington, D.C. The one in Sacramento is on October 2nd. It's a Wednesday. David Spady, I was going to show you a great video that David Spady has been working on with kid cages in New Mexico and the Sitaway um, family whose sheep were killed. Um, it's devastating. And what the other side is doing, they have kids doing videos on how you can go and testify on behalf of children, on behalf of wolves and protecting wolves and getting more wolves into our communities. This is an evil, evil plan. And under Agenda 21, it is about the Wildlands Project. It's about the Wildlands Project. It's about getting us off the rural lands, out of Yosemite. Um, creating areas where there's no little to no human use. All this stuff is happening right now. You can look at Orleans maps in the other room. These are uh, habitat corridor protect protection areas. Um, and this is what we're facing right now. The red is no human use. The yellow is buffer zones, limited to little human use. And you and I live in the one Bay Area. And that's what we need to keep fighting. So with that, um, I'm going to show you um, a clip that Orlean sent out last night. Um, and this is to set us up with the next segment on, uh, and this is equally enraging. Um, so Orlean, did you want to say anything about that? And OK. Uh, this shows you why we have Common Core, and it's being promoted and pushed throughout the world, is because of saving the environment. And our children are being pro propagandized into thinking that Mother Earth is about to die and they have to be there. The little rescue children, they're going to be used for actually cannon fodder. They're the little ones that are going to be going and promoting all these environmental causes. And you'll be hearing more about that in our next presentation. But this is what came out last night. A man was speaking out against Common Core in Maryland. And look what happened to him. He said the weapons of mass destruction. Well, and, and, and this, my, my sister sent this in preparation for today. This is uh, what my niece, who's uh, 13 years old, had to read in her math class. So you can see it's all about Common Core and the Common Good. The weapons of mass destruction. All right. Let me get this video. It's 20 seconds. It's very short. And I can find it. Go find it once we find it. Two questions actually tell them that. And so I'm just trying them all together. So I'm going to get to the How are we going to get to as many questions as we can? So if you can answer this, it's actually for the parents. It's not really for the parents. I don't know how many parents here are aware that the goal of the conference for Sanders isn't to prepare a total of the world's world class universities. It's to prepare a community college. Let me do this. Other questions. I do want to be fair. Community college, and you know, it's a really, 
know, so sure. my question is, how are we, uh, you're not talking about the way technology, you're not preparing the preparing for world park. Okay, my question is, how is lowering America's education standards to prepare kids for community college? Because that's what it's all about. Because you mentioned before, they, you know, the emphasis is, and I have some stuff here to quote before this guy tries to carry me out. Okay. But, hey, listen, parents are paying people. We're sitting, this is not a CNN playbook, mate. Let's go. This, hey, Let him ask his question. This is what I will say. Oh, okay, no, 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 last no, no, we do have some that are dovetailing to that. Let him ask his so, question. So the next question. So this, this is a dovetail. Don't stand for this. Right? You're sitting here like cattle. You have questions. You have yeah. questions. Yeah. So what happened, this man was taken out and put in jail and he was charged with uh, some felony count of pushing the police officer when it was just the opposite. And he, there's like a $2,000 fine, it's just amazing. What, and just because the questions that were submitted they had to be on a card and they were changing the questions. So he was saying, no, the truth is our children are not even being prepared for a junior college level through Common Core. And that they had to shush, shush him down and send him out with a police it officer. It was a Delphi program. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, anyway. Yes. And I, I think it was disturbing that none of the parents, no hardly one any up. parent, no one was up. standing up. And like Steve just said, if that happens here, we need to stand together. All together. And we need to block the door. Right. So right. that they can't take one of us out as we're standing and defending our rights as free people in a free nation concerned about our children. That's really the truth. Anyway, Debbie is amazing. Thank you so much. As you see, she could go on for several hours. Maybe someday we'll give a whole conference just to Debbie. Because this is a huge issue. If you would all grab a